Praise be to Jesus Christ. Hello and welcome. I, my name is Joe McLean. I am the host of Catholic Drive Time, heard Monday through Friday, 7 to 9 Eastern, or 6 through 8 Central, depending on where you live. And we are heard all across the Guadalupe Radio Network. And I'm joined by my producer, Adrian Fonseca. Good morning to you, Adrian. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be here. Praise is be it? To God. Yes, praise be to God. It's good to be here. All. Despite of it all, it's good to be here. Well, praise be to God. We're so grateful to the Perpetual Light Society. You know what? You make it possible for us to continue to do what we do. We share the good, the true, the beautiful, sometimes the salty, sometimes the sweet. But either way, we help keep you informed and inspired. And we want to say thank you for your generous, perpetual gifts. Every single share we know we can count on you, and it makes the world a difference to us. So we have something special planned for you today. Adrian, what do we have? We have two interviews back-to-back, and they're going to be smashed together, uh, Claire and Gabriel Castillo. You may have heard Gabriel Castillo before. We've had him on our show a number of times. If you're a Catholic Drive Time listener, you've heard him before. If not, well, this will be your first time hearing him. Praise be to God. And I am happy to be uh, the one to introduce you to him. And his assistant, Claire, they do amazing work on YouTube and in the local parish. Amen to that. So the title of this talk is called Refuge of Sinners, How Mary Saved Two Souls to Save Many. And you're going to love this. These two people are very inspirational, very encouraging, and we just love their zeal for Holy Mother Church, for Our Lady, and for evangelization. So it's going to be a wonderful presentation. Sit back and relax, and let us present to you Claire Allerud and Gabriel Castillo. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Joining us right now in studio is Gabriel Castillo. He has a couple of wonderful YouTube channels, Gabby After Hours, True Faith TV, and he's also a youth minister at a parish in Houston, Texas. Praise be to God. Welcome to the program. It's an Gabriel honor Castillo. to be here, Joe. As usual, I'm so thankful to be here with you and Adrian in the studio. Amen. Uh, we want to talk to you about your conversion, because we yes. know you weren't always an incredible Catholic. Not at all. The worst of the worst, the I think. The worst of the worst. Well, actually, actually, the best of the worst and the worst of the best. I like to say I that. I like that. Can I steal that? That's yes, good, you may. actually. Yes, you may. Um, you know, we've been talking about how Our Lady impacts so many souls. Yes. And I think Our Lady has played a, a crucial role in your own journey. And yes. I hope you'll share that with us. A hundred percent. So... I, where would you like me to start? From the beginning? Yeah. In the beginning was the Word. In the, the beginning word. was Gabriel. <laughs> in, in the beginning was Gabriel and his mother, and not good practicing Catholics, but we called ourselves Catholics. We went to Mass maybe on Christmas and Easter, maybe. Okay. I didn't make my first Holy Communion until I was in middle school, and I had no—I didn't, I didn't know the structure. I just saw, knew that Holy Communion was something that kids did— and I had not done that yet, so I asked to make my first Holy Communion. I didn't know any Our Fathers or Hail Marys. They made me learn it, but I, f- I didn't memorize it. I didn't learn it really well. Wow. And uh, But I could. the Lord was still—I I had a very spiritual sense. I do recall many times growing up going to, like, the, my mom had, like, a little— I, maybe even superstition— uh, altar with little saints and a lot of saints and a lot of pictures of Jesus in a Bible. And I do remember a couple of occasions opening the Bible and having a profound sense of the divine all around me, but those moments quickly passed. Mm. And I became mired in sin, as many worldly high school students do. Mm -hmm. Um, I was good in the eyes of many because I was in honors classes, so I was academically pretty good. Uh, because we didn't have a lot of money, I did not spend a lot of money on drugs and those kind of things. So I was blessed in that way, blessed to be poor. Yeah. And my mom was a good mother. She disciplined me. She made sure that I didn't look too bad um, or didn't get too out of hand. But it wasn't until college I applied to the University of St. Thomas and because they were the first uh, school to get back to me. And to accept me, and they were giving—I think they gave everybody a presidential scholarship. No offense, <laughs> no offense if you didn't get one, Adrian. But I feel like they every, everybody I talked to has some sort of well, scholarship you're easy, there. You're easy, yeah. So, uh, and I had the last name Castillo, so they really liked that. Sure. Sorry, well, sorry again, Fonseca. You didn't, <laughs> didn't get one, but uh, so I went there, and I began to take the philosophy and the theology courses, and they really piqued my interest because. The Catholic faith is rational and it's reasonable, at least I find, Mm -hmm. especially because I always realized how bad I was. So when I would do these bad things, like I said, I had a very spiritual nature. I felt guilty about it. 
Every once in a while, actually, now that I think about it, I would watch TBN. Have you ever, did you ever watch TBN, the Trinity sure. Broadcasting Network? On occasion, you know? yeah, so back I, in the day. That was like my only religious formation in really? high school. Before baseball games, I would turn on TBN as like a superstitious practice. You checked the card. Yeah, I, I, I checked it out. I checked out that lady with the pink hair who's very like... I remember. People falling over. <laughs> no sure. Idea. So I... I believed that there was like a higher power. I just had no formation in that. Yeah. And getting that formation at the University of St. Thomas that was reasonable and rational, especially concupiscence, I was I was a firm believer in trying to figure out why I was so bad and why I couldn't stop these things. And that played a major role in my life. I started to be interested in the sacrament of confirmation as many of the other lukewarm Catholics that were my friends were starting to get confirmed. And having their witness of being bad Catholics getting confirmed made me say, hey, I'm a bad Catholic too. I barely go to church. I, I barely step foot in that chapel of St. Basil. And so that got me interested. And a young woman, I forget her name now. It's quite unfortunate. That's what happens when you die. People forget about you. A young woman who was in the environmental studies program died, and they had a service for her in the chapel of St. Basil. And that was the first time that I entered the chapel to pray, mm -hmm. uh, and I broke down crying when I went in, not so much because she died or because of the service that was going on, but more that I had a sense that this is, this is something very powerful in here, and I had a very spiritual moment then. So I went through with that confirmation program, their RCIA, which was done by one of the best theologians I'd ever met. His name is Father Daniel Callum, still alive today. Um, he's in his late mid, mid to late 80s brilliant theologian. So my brain was Catholic. My brain was firing on all the cylinders, making the connections, getting super excited about it. But my heart, my heart was far from God. My mm. heart was mired in sin. Uh, yeah, I just was given into the world, the flesh, and the devil. And on one occasion, this is uh, a major turning point for me. On one occasion, because of the confirmation program, we had adoration and I went on the adoration, and I had a profound experience in the Most Holy Eucharist. And that's when the Lord kind of stuck a, a sword in my heart. And before, my brain was all in, but the adoration was like the finger of God. A, a, my first like real encounter with the divine in Eucharistic adoration, and my heart just bled. All the, the pain, all the sins of my life just kind of bled out, and I cried for that entire uh, adoration. Wow. And uh, I went to my friends and I said, this is real. Like, this is real. I have to change my life. I have to. So I would go to the adoration uh, at the chapel of St. Basil and I began to live in the chapel, but I did not give up my sins. So I was, I was like the epitome of a hypocrite because I would com continue to be a public sinner, partying mm -hmm. and going and doing all these things. But during the day, I would spend time in the adoration chapel. Was, how would you go to, uh, how would you like actually pray in adoration? Because I know like when I first started going to adoration, the first time I went, it was praise and worship adoration. And then yes. the first time I ever went to a silent adoration, yes. I had no idea what to do. Yes. So like, how did you end up figuring out what to do in adoration? At that, at that retreat, it was a little bit of praise and worship -y. I did not know that it was going to be. So I asked my professor... Uh, who is also there, I said, hey, how do you do adoration? What is, I've never been to adoration. How do you do adoration? And he said, you just look at the Lord. And I said, well, I'm just going to sit there and look at the Lord for an hour. And he <laughs> said, no, well, I, like, can I have some steps? And he recommended repeating the holy name of Jesus. And I was like, okay, well, that's a start. So we went in and I repeated the name of Jesus for about 10 minutes. And I began to hear a, a voice kind of saying, hey, stop talking. I have something to say to you. And I thought I was talking to myself, so I just kept repeating the name of Jesus. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it turned out that I, it was like, I can't, I, it was a little bit of myself, but it was definitely God. And in that moment, I saw like the face of Jesus. And this was before the, the movie The Passion came out. So I saw like a, a divine images flashing before my eyes of the passion that it was all in an instant too, that I realized one, that I had, I, I think I'd been given this supernatural gift of understanding or of believing that Jesus was really present. Because after that moment, I lived as if Jesus was really present in the Eucharist. I did not live as if I was going to go to hell because I had sin, but the person of God, the person of love, was in that 
tabernacle and was in that e- Eucharist in the monstrance. So I even I even broke up with one of my girlfriends because she was Catholic. Mind you, public sinner doing this. I broke up with her because she was Catholic, but she wouldn't go to mass enough. Or really? she would she wouldn't visit the chapel enough. And I would I would get on her, I'd say, You believe in the Eucharist? Yeah. Then how come you never go? <laughs> but I I was th- like I was the, I was the epitome of the greatest hypocrite, but I, in a way I didn't know. And then that's when I would say the devil saved my life. So for one Lent, because I was now trying to live the Catholic faith, for one Lent I said, "Okay, Lord, I think I'm going to try to give up mortal sin for Lent." And so I went to confession with that great priest, Father Daniel Callum. I went to confession with him. And I didn't make it two hours before I was back in mortal sin. Not even, maybe it was only an hour. It was, it was humiliating. And yeah. it was humiliating because I was actually trying. Mm-hmm. Whereas before I was sinning and I was like, yeah, this is, this is fun. This is life. This is what I've been raised on, what, what's important. But I actually genuinely tried to be good and I couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. And so I had true contrition. I cried that night uh, shortly after realizing how uh, much of a failure I was. <laughs> I cried very profound tears of sorrow. And when I was m- expressing my contrition to God, I heard the voice that I, I believe was a demon, and I heard it audibly with my ears. So I said something to the effect of, God, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. I'm I'm truly sorry. And then I audibly heard... Uh, a scary voice mocking me, and I can't make the the sound, but it, it it was very high pitched and very graspily saying, "Oh God, I'm sorry." I can't even get my voice to that pitch to, wow. to reenact it, and so I was immediately uh, struck with fear, and almost as if in, as in an instinct, my brain, and I think I'm now looking back on, I think it was my guardian angel thought to think of St. John Vianney. So I said, St. John Vianney, pray for me. I did not know anything about the life of St. John Vianney. I knew he was a saint. Now looking back on that, I think that thought obviously had to come in from my garden angel simply because now that I know the life of John Vianney and his battle with the demon, uh, immediately that scary voice went away. And I had been given a rosary by a great professor, the same professor who taught me how to adore the Lord, or at least gave me some tips. And I had not prayed it. Let's go back real quick yes. before you go on. And the your professor, which I'll just tell everybody, is yes. Dr. Dr. Rebar. Yeah, uh, we name. had him on our show yes. a while ago, a long yes. time ago. We have to have him back. And uh, so... What happened? How? Why did he give you a rosary randomly? I mean, I no I've idea. had him in a class for years, and he's I've never seen him give someone a rosary uh, before. So. I don't know. Well, I, I think maybe he saw me going through the RCIA program, and this was in the middle of the RCIA that he actually gave it to me. And, uh, it, I, and I actually found it because I was like, what happened to that rosary? And I found it last night when I was cleaning up, uh, preparing for a move, and I like held it, and I was like, ah, this is where it all started. So I don't know what why he gave it to me. I was having a very bad time in life, but he didn't know that, and I didn't think anybody knew that. And to my surprise, he after class, he's like, Gabriel, stay and talk to me. And I was like, oh, I'm in trouble Ouch. again. And, uh, <laughs> what have you done? That's what I thought. I was doing everything wrong at that point. And he had a handful of wooden beads, and he said that he had gotten it uh, at a general audience and had it blessed by Pope John Paul II. So that that night after I had that first diabolical manifestation— uh, I was afraid to be in my room, despite the fact that my mom, I was, I was at my mom's house. Or, yeah, my mom's house. So I was in my bedroom, and I got this pamphlet on how to pray the rosary. And so I was sitting on my bed, at the edge of my bed, and I looked at it, and I said, okay, how do you do this? In, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I believe, and the moment I said the words, I believe, I felt a force not only just grab me by the throat, but slam my entire person down on the bed, and it felt as if I was being pinned down and being choked. I recall being able to breathe and having a sudden panic and trying to scream out for my mom to, 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 to come and help me, but I couldn't get the words out. So it was just like I was gasping. And again, I think it was my guardian angel now looking back on it. I heard or felt the enlightenment, a little spark in my mind to pray the Hail Mary. And... I couldn't. I tried to get the words out, and I couldn't. And then, ag- again, the spark was like, or the light, the illumination was like, say it internally. Say it in your mind. So I got the first 
the, the words Hail Mary out in my mind, and I felt a little bit of relief, and I was able to say the words with my lips, Hail Mary. And once I said those words, instantaneously, everything in the room was back to normal, whereas it felt like everything was spinning and I was, you know, spiraling out of control. In that instant, everything was normal and calm and peaceful, and I was freaked out beyond belief. I can imagine. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, it was one of the greatest things that ever happened to me. Praise be and, to God. I, and I've meditated a lot upon that. But what happened immediately was that I wanted to find out what was going on. Because I had a sense that I had always had this demon. Well, obviously, if I, the first time I'm actually really, truly trying to stop, you know, my habitual sins and I can't, and I, I, I automatically understood that I had had this demon for a very, very long time, that this is something that I must have had since I was in middle school or in high school, and I just never tried to, to be good. Um, and I think looking back on it, him or it noticing that I had true contrition that I was going to turn to Our Lady, that his grip on my life was starting to loosen, mm. that he must have been uh, desperate. And and I always like to say that the devil is Mary's monkey. So mm. Our Lady <laughs> probably let him off the leash just for a little bit to, to frighten me into religious zealotry. Amen. Because, Praise be to God. <laughs> because immediately what <laughs> happened after that, there was this great website. I don't think it exists anymore, but it's called the Padre Pio Center for Deliverance. Oh, wow. And they had, and it was, I think it was, I don't know who put it together, but it was extraordinarily well done, where they explained all sorts of diabolical manifestations and how there are various things that are hooks. So intrinsically disordered objects like pornography, like um, contraceptive pills, like bad bad posters, like New Age books or Buddha statues, statues of false gods. So on their website, they're saying these are all entry points of the devil. If you have these things in your home, whether they be cursed or not, because they are intrinsically disordered, they're in, they are intrinsically anti-Christ. Statues of false gods are anti-Christ, whether they're the anti-Christ, of course, uh, that's up for debate. But these things are entry points for the devil. If you're trying to be liberated from a demon— you must get rid of all of these things, renounce sin, go to confession, surround yourself with holy things. If, you're, if your house is infested, you got to put holy pictures up. You have to have religious music playing in the air because the demons are demons of the air. And at that time, I was listening to all the worldly music. I had all the Eminem and Snoop Dogg and all that kind of stuff. And so I, within 24 hours, trashed everything. And I love my mom. She always Praise gets be to God. she always gets offended when I talk about this. She she was doing the best she could at the time. Sure. She had no formation of her own. She's like, You always you always bring me down when you tell your conversion. I was like, it's part of the story. Part of the and, story. And and I should say now, my mom is an extraordinary she does a daily holy hour. She's extraordinarily holy. Uh, but it's just it's just part of our journey. So she had new age books, she had Buddha statues, she had African statues, she had all she she had because uh, in the Hispanic community She's a Hispanic. They believe in, you know, these witches and healers and tarot cards and palm sure. readers. So we had the all, yeah, we had all of that stuff in our history. My mom would bring these people to our house. Oh wow! We, yeah, we, yeah. She was friends with people who could read your no tea wonder leaves. You were being harassed by a demon. Yeah, I, I yeah. This is, goes back to my childhood. Yeah. So not the mortal sin and uh, activity in the occult. Uh, so after wide that, open door, wide open door. It's not an open door. It's it's a entry. Enter here. We are open for business. Sign. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so right. I got rid of everything. I smashed my mom's Buddha statues. I got her statues, <laughs> broke them in the street. I wow. burned her books. I ripped them to shreds. She so must not have been happy for, about you. We had a major fight. Is an understatement. When she got home that day from really? work, oh, she, she was ready to literally kill me. Wow. literally kill me. And there was a great uh, nun at uh, University of St. Thomas at the time, Sister Madeline Grace, because I was, I was uh, well, thinking, well, maybe I'm being disobedient. These things belong to my mom. I'm destroying her stuff. And I, I, the morality on destroying other people's evil, according to Aquinas, is still out. But Sister <laughs> Madeline Grace had my back. <laughs> so uh, You know the story of uh, Abraham, right? What is you that? Know, Tell Abraham me. was, he was 
According to to the uh, to tradition, it's not in the in scripture, but in the tradition, the Saint, uh, Abraham, whenever his his father was an idol maker, so oh, he built and, wow. and created idols. And so one day, his dad was going on a journey, and at this point, Abraham is already a monotheist. He believes mm. in the one true God. And as Abraham is gone, he comes in with a with a bat and destroys all the idols in the wow. room <laughs> except for the biggest one, and puts the uh, the stick into the hand of the biggest one. And when his dad comes home, he sees everything destroyed and he sees the giant statue with the with the uh, stick in his hand and he turns to Abraham and starts yelling at him for destroying his statues. And he goes, "What do you mean it was him?" Wow. And he was like, "What do you what do you mean it's him? He can't That's do great. it. He's just an idol." He goes, "Exactly." Oh, exactly. very good. And He's so an uh, and they, so the it was, uh, so there you go. A yes. example of someone destroying uh, their parents' idols. Wow. Well. Yes, my mom and I got into major battles, but it was, for me, like I said, one of the best things that ever happened to me. Because I was partially afraid and partially, for good reason, afraid, I would have EWTN. Back in the day, back in the early 2000s, EWTN had an extraordinary audio library. I remember. I, in my own conversion process, I discovered this audio library, yeah. and I downloaded tons of content, burned them onto CDs, yes. and I had entire books yes. full of these cases full of these uh, yes. CDs that I burnt from the library. It was a gold mine. They had, it was, it, yeah. My favorite stuff was the the Lives of the Saints by Bob and Penny Lord. Sure. I, I just consumed the lives of the saints, yeah. and because their lives were so uh, extraordinary, I thought that was ordinary. Yeah. So it, it opened and expanded my mind to the possibilities of what God could do. Mm-hmm. And so it gave me uh, a, a fire in my chest. You, they say that only somebody who's hot can spread fire to another person. Yeah. And so I was hanging out with the hottest of, of people, the saints of God. And so that played a tremendous role in my life. And as I began to now root out sin and live in the, the chapel of St. Basil, Mm -hmm. uh, I began to hear the voice of God more clearly, at least what I believe to be the voice of God more clearly, and to guide me and to give me direction. And I was originally studying math and engineering, and my grades in math and engineering were worse than bad, and my grades in theology all of a sudden began to explode. But it was more so not that I was studying any differently, I don't think, but because I was living a holier life, Theology, it was more of a lived theology, and I was able to make connections, and all the EWTN and all the Mitch Pacwa and all yeah. this stuff was coming into my brain. And so I had no other no other option than to become a religious educator, <laughs> simply because I was doing so badly in school. Sure. So I like to say that God set me up with all my failures, but I had right no other time. option. Yeah, perfect at the timing. Right. When that happened to me, I had already gone through school, and it was yeah. kind of too late at that yeah. point to... To retread and, to pivot. and find yeah. another way. So uh, praise be to God that he's got you on this journey. Yes, so that led me to, to give my life to God and say, all right, Lord, religious education seems— but I w- I'm a smart person. I could do anything. I always—I think that at least. I don't know. Maybe I couldn't. Maybe it's just <laughs> uh, false ideas of pride or whatever, hubris. But I objectively, I, I'm pretty bright. I can figure things out. I could do any profession— so I had told myself that I will live a life of poverty for three years and I'll teach religious education in whatever Catholic school that I could get into because I felt like God was saying to me in prayer, you have a spirituality that you need to share with other people, with young people. And because I have pulled you out of these sins and you saw that it started in your, in your younger years, you give me three years to help raise, uh, raise young people out. Of, of sin. So I got a job working at St. Lawrence Catholic School mm-hmm. in Sugarland, Texas. One of the best things that ever happened to me. And, and that's, I, I like to say, everything I learned, I learned it while I was in middle school <laughs> because I was teaching middle school. <laughs> I learned about prudence. I learned about what to say, what not to say. I learned how to be as cunning as a serpent and as gentle as a dove. Amen. But I learned that through many, many mistakes and battles and imprudences when dealing with people. I did not know that the Catholic school system in the United States was not ready for young people to become saints. Wow. So I went in there, guns blazing, no sin, pray the rosary every day, go to Mass as frequently (laughs) as possible, weekly holy hour, all these things. The things that I knew I needed to stay out of sin, I said, yeah, I'm going to teach you theology, but I'm going to 
also give you a spirituality that I know for a fact works. Mm-hmm. Con- frequent confession. How can you go to heaven if you're not going to confession? Mm-hmm. If you, especially if you're a teenager and you got and this is and the advent of the iPhone. The, this was when the first iPhone was coming out, and I had the wealthiest of kids, and they began to get their own iPhones, their own iPod touches, which at the time I was aware because I had been just recently overcoming these battles with online temptations that are available. And so I automatically knew, well, if you've got an internet uh, surfing device in your pocket that you can take with you anywhere and your parents are buying them for you to try and keep your attention away from reality. So I was fighting battles that I don't think that the school system in the United States was ready to handle. Mm -hmm. Um, And so there was a lot of butting of heads. Partially, I was young. I was brash. I did not. I was not as cunning as a serpent and as gentle as a dove. I could have yeah. handled things better. Um, so we parted ways at St. Lawrence. But before I did, I went and made an extraordinary retreat. And this is when things really got heated. I made an extraordinary retreat um, with a, a priest named Father Bing, who's a great holy man. And he had a religious community that he had founded. And they were living a life of reparation and of devotion to the Eucharist and no communion on the hand and kneeling for communion and multiple rosaries a day. And one of their priests was known for having the gift of reading souls. And so I made a general confession with him. And, uh, and of course, you know, when we confess, and this is one of the benefits of a general confession, it's very easy to think that I'm a good person if I've gone a long time without doing some serious sins Mm -hmm. and I'm just confessing maybe once a month, once every two weeks, and they're small things compared to what's out there. It's easy for me to think I'm a good man. You know, I'm doing pretty good. But when you look back at a life of sin over an entire lifetime from your age of reason to your mid-20s, early 30s, which where I was at, you realize how horrible you are. Even if you're just confessing, even if you didn't do many horrible things, just all your sins added up from your monthly confessions. You realize just how much God has done for you. Yeah. And so I was broken. I broke down in that general confession uh, just because I saw uh, the evil impact that I've had on the world and how little good I had done. And so the priest said, you, this is not, he made it very clear that this is not your penance, but you're obviously suffering from guilt for sins committed and people you've led astray, I encourage you for one year to pray all the mysteries of the rosary every day for one year in reparation for the sins you've committed and to bring good in the lives of those people that you've hurt. Wow. And then after that one year, don't even think about it again. Just move forward and forget about it. You've done your time. You've given it to Our Lady. Now you dedicate your life to serving God. And never receive Holy Communion on the hand ever again. And kneel for Holy Communion in, in, wow. in, as long as you possibly can. And I said, I was sold. I was like, I'm in. Let's do this. And so, Because <laughs> it's easier sometimes when you have like a list of things to do. Yeah. When you, he gave me a rule of life, basically. Yeah, and he exactly. said, start going to confession these times. And if you do that, you will have the tools necessary to overcome evil and go from victory to victory. So I was teaching this lifestyle to my, to my middle schoolers and it stuck in some of them. But of course, you know, priests aren't ready to hear weekly confess, or at least not most priests in the United States and Catholic school system. You've Mm -hmm. got a hundred and 200 kids in your middle school and you're trying to make them into saints and uh, there's going to be some conflicts. So I switched jobs and I was blessed to be uh, hired by Father Bart Reynolds at St. Teresa's Catholic Church in Sugarland, Texas, where we saw more eye to eye. He, when he hired me, he said, hey, I have a mission for you. And I said, what is that mission? He said, stir the pot. And I said, to which direction? And he said, <laughs> to the right, of course. And I said, let's do this. Wow. Let's do this. And then he said, you have one year to make yourself indispensable here. You have one year. Because a lot of my former uh, former students, their parents, I'm giving you guys the full behind the scenes here. A lot of my former students, their parents loved loved what they saw in their young people. And so they donated to St. Teresa's um, the, the money to pay my salary for one year. No kidding. So Father Reynolds said, you have one year to make yourself indispensable so that I have a reason to hire you. And so I started as no pr- pressure, no pressure. Yeah. O- only my family and everything was uh, riding on it. 
And so that's when I started making YouTube videos, partially because my former students were going off to their various public schools, their lukewarm Catholic high schools. Can we be honest? We, oh, can we be honest? There's oh, lukewarm yeah. Catholic high schools. Um, they're lukewarm Catholic high schools. If you don't want me to call you lukewarm, don't be lukewarm, and we don't have any, we won't have an issue. <laughs> <laughs> they were going off to their lukewarm schools, and they were coming back saying, "We need help. <laughs> we need we need support. Please make YouTube videos." And I didn't. I would, and you can check, and you can look at the dates on my YouTube channel. Uh, I would repackage other people's YouTube videos, so I'd find homilies, and I would uh, cut them together, kind of like uh, kind of like Census Fidelum does now. Sure. I would I would do that. I would find Cardinal Lorenzo videos. I would steal them. My, my morality is very gray sometimes. <laughs> I, it, it belongs to the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and I give permission to anybody to steal my content as well for you the glory of God. You heard it here first, folks. So yeah. uh, it all belongs to God. <laughs> That's probably not good theology, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm certain it's not good theology, but whatever. <laughs> we'll sort it out later. We'll sort it out later. We'll let God separate go. separate the goats from the sheep. Right. Exactly. Anyway, so I started uploading there, but then working at uh, Saint Teresa's, we had a great youth minister named Matt Johns, and he was doing a series for his high school kids where he would record various people answer apologetics questions, and that was the first time. I had ever been on camera, and it, it, the little video I made for them was received well, and so I began to film myself as a Lenten exercise, and this was during, remember the Shaytards? Was it Shay? I do remember that. Were they the no Shaytards? So the, yes. it, was like the, it was like the advent of vlogging. Yeah. Shay uh, something or exactly, other. Exactly, yes. And then I thought, I can do that, and anytime I tried, I failed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tried to do it, and th the video I, wouldn't record. I remember some of those early videos of you, Gabe. I mean, yeah. I used to sitting love watching you back in the old yes. days, and you, yeah, sitting in your car. Remember After like, hours. Like, that used to be a very popular thing. It kind of still is, to some degree, people yeah. in their car. Not anymore, I think. Matt now, Walsh made his start yes, filming in his, in, his car, car. in his car. So uh, many people did, but uh, I remember those videos. They were very so good. So th that was good, but you, what you did not catch was the my life part that for some reason would not edit. The mm. only thing that stayed was the spiritual reflections. Cause so I'd like did a 40 days for Lent. I'd go to the Adoration Chapel for two hours to see if it would change me and what my reflections were. And all of that got cut out. The only thing that lasted was my Marian reflections for some reason. Really? When I would edit it, everything would like not work. The audio would die. Wow. And so I, I learned very quickly that what Our Lady was saying, nobody cares about you, you're trash, <laughs> you're garbage. I'm the only thing worthy here. Let's, okay, so to that point then, yes. let's jump to Our Lady. Yes, please. Okay, because you mentioned earlier about yeah. how, like, the, the Hail Mary helped to yes, vanquish definitely. this diabolical oppression. Um, you are a guy that is obvious you're madly in love with yes. Our Lady. It kind of reminds me, I have a personal affirm, uh, you know, affection to St. Max Colbert. Yes, my man. Uh, I, I mean, uh, is Gabe, not Gabe, but Adrian over here bought this uh, for me from, from Poland. You know, yes. So I love Max Colbert, a guy who was madly in love with Our Lady. Madder than we can ever describe with human words. I, you're the yeah. next best thing to that, wow. in my opinion. How did that happen? Sometimes in prayer, Our Lady accuses me of not loving her for her own sake because <laughs> she is truly the sweetest, best, easiest path to Jesus Christ. It started because her life is the easiest, easiest life. I, I found very quickly when I tried to do Mary's will, and not just God's will, but I involved Mary in this, it was just my life became a lot easier. Conflicts they were conflicts are going to come, but they were dipped in honey, as St. Louis de Montfort says. My crosses all of a sudden became bearable, became sweeter, and life was just significantly easier with Mary. My I overcame sin, my habitual sin that I had struggled with with the demons in my life through the rosary, so I knew it was effective. And actually, I took Maximilian Colby as a patron as well, not knowing how powerful his theology was going to be. Not knowing that. So on one occasion, now I have I find it my personal mission to promote the rosary, especially all the mysteries of the rosary. But Our Lady is the winner. I just, I wish it, I wish it was because I had a vision of Mary and because I loved her from the bottom of my heart because she's the mother of God. Like, you know, the saints have such great virtue. They love God for his own sake. Yeah. I, I find there, I always have that temptation like, 
it's, it's, it's just when my heart is failing, I just know from human reason, from experience, Mary is the easiest way. If, if I want my life to be easy, I just ha- I have to go with her. Mm. You know, that reminds me of something that I, I didn't make this up. Sure. I'm not, I, I can't remember where I got it from, so I can't cite it. But there's something I, I would often say when I was praying, and you just remind me of that. I said, I would pray, um, Lord, I desire to desire you. Yes. Because sometimes I'm like, I'm sitting in adoration yes. and I'm like, I don't want to be here, yes. but I want to want to be here. Yes. And it's and sometimes it's hard. And that's what I'm thinking of yes. when you're saying this. It's like, you know, we love Our Lady, uh, but sometimes I just, I want to love Our Lady yes. more and I don't, and I love her insufficiently. Yes. And when I don't want to pray the rosary, I would notice that when I wouldn't pray my rosaries, I would fall. And not only would I fall, but I would mess things up in other people's lives. So I would drop the ball in a certain situation where other people were depending on me to mm-hmm. where I would pray the rosary. And this is when I learned it was okay. I would pray the rosary simply so not to mess things up. You know what I mean? Because I knew that if I prayed it, she had my back and my personal self-interest would be taken care of. So on one occasion, I mentioned this to Adrian. This was, Adrian was actually the first person I mentioned this publicly, but now I'm, I'm a little bit more okay with it. Uh, on one occasion, I was at World Youth Day in Brazil, and I was um, I was already thoroughly convinced of the rosary. I was already thoroughly, not Brazil, on Spain, thoroughly convinced of the theology of Our Lady. I'm just now realizing how much deeper it can go. And I, had been, I was praying in a chapel of St. Dominic, and I was questioning my life. I'd, one of the things when I started working at St. Teresa's is I would question my life a lot because how long could I go on as the promoter of evangelization, making a teacher's salary for the most part. Um, what am I going to do with my life? Like, I just, I didn't have fulfillment. Uh, I was, I just was looking, wh- where am I going next? I didn't have purpose. Um, and so I, I was searching for answers about the meaning and purpose of my life. Like, mm. what next? Because I had kind of seen it as like the net that I got caught in from when I left St. Lawrence. And so I was at World Youth Day, and I was praying in the Church of St. Dominic, and I was standing before—this is a church where St. Dominic, I believe, was baptized, I believe so. Yeah, it was his baptismal font was there. And I was praying before a statue of St. Dominic, and I believe it was a moment of clarity that St. Dominic was saying to me, I have to promote the rosary, and I have to promote it the way he promoted it, wow. but to take advantage of every means possible— and because of the technology, it's going to be easier. And I, I'm putting words to something that happened interiorly, and so my words vary. But the idea was I have means at my disposal that he could never have dreamed of. The ability to, tr- to tri-locate, multi-locate. I can make a video here, and it can be sent there, 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 and all across the world. Are you saying you're not trilocating right now? No, I wish I was because I've, <laughs> <laughs> I've got a house to move. <laughs> and then I can, easy, then, and then I always <laughs> joke because I, people will say Padre Pio prayed like 30 rosaries or something. And I'm like, well, he could buy a locate. He probably, I, I'm, I, I'm not saying he did, but I would have, I would have, if it was me and I was three places at once all praying the rosary, I'd be like, that counts for three. <laughs> <laughs> well, how many does it count when uh, everybody is praying uh, with you whenever you're posting yourself praying the rosary? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Zero. You know, same Pray Louis more. De, same Louis de Mumford. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's true. About yes, yes, yes. Praying yes. with other people. That's right. And it multiplies the power, multiplies the effect. So I felt that as a personal mission. And then ever since that's when I started seeing YouTube, at least, as a means for accomplishing a goal. Mm. And so my number one goal on YouTube is to bring souls to Mary. And I'm just now, this this mission, at least for me, has only now become more and more clear as uh, just through prayer and understanding. And so Maximilian Colby, as you, it's funny that you mentioned him. Mm. He, I, I personally, really, from the bottom of my heart, in my mind, believe his theology is at the core, at the heart, of the future of the church and the salvation of the church and the conversion of the church and going from victory to victory and never losing a single battle. He His writings are synthesized very beautifully in a great book that I've been pondering uh, called The Marian Vow, which was made by the Franciscan Friars of the Immaculate. It's about religious vow that they take, but the theology in it, his theology that he was perfecting just before the time of his death concerning the, uh, the Holy Spirit, 
concerning the Immaculate Conception, concerning who Mary is. There's a lot of quotes, one in particular that stands out to me that Maximilian said. He said, union with the Immaculata, union with Mary. Now here, now here is a method that will guarantee success because Mm -hmm. Mary never loses. So union, and then he had this great, this is all stuff I've been pondering lately. So he had this great math equation that he put when he'd given a conference for seminarians in Rome where he put the secret to sanctity and he put the, the letter, the capital W, and a plus sign with a little w equals s. And he said the secret to sanctity is uniting your will with God's will. That is sanctity. And the Immaculata, who is perfectly united to the Holy Spirit, is her will and his will are perfectly united. That's why they are basically one breath. You hear her voice. You're, bas- you're basically not you're hearing. You're yeah. basically hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit. So if Mary is God's will in the sweetest, most perfect, most efficient, most everything way, why don't you unite your will to her will? She never fails. And mm. when you do Mary's will, the Holy Spirit flows through that and the Holy Spirit works and the Holy Spirit transforms and she will never lose. And he gave this beautiful long quote that I don't have it memorized, but it effectively said this, we need to surrender our lives to Mary, allow her to live in us, pray to her, ask her, what is your will in all things? At every moment, say, what is your will? Because she's God's sweetest method, he won't deny us knowing what her will is. Ask for that grace. And he said, to the point where it is no longer I who live, but Mary living in me. Wow. And then, yeah, it, it, it That's sounds... a bold statement. It sounds, ma- it sounds like madness. And then he goes on to say, and if you do this, not only will you go from victory to victory, mm-hmm. but you will not... And not only will you become a saint, but you will become a great saint. And that, that quote in particular stands out to me because that's exactly what he did. He said, this is the recipe that will make you a great saint. Check it out. I'm going to do it, and I'm going to prove it. So that this theology of Maximilian Kolbe has been blowing my mind lately. Mm-hmm. So could um, you call it Mary Maximalism? Mary and Maximalism. <laughs> and so there's two methods, and I have, not, I have not publicly talked about this. This is the first time. I've talked about it at a conference I gave recently, but I don't think they took me seriously. Um, because I gave the talk two days in a row and they still had a glazed look in their eyes. <laughs> yeah, like, what, what did you say? He's like, what? Just smile, just <laughs> yeah. smile. Maximilian Colby was a nut. He would say he that... He was a nut. He, he would say, he would say you, we should be transubstantiated into the Virgin Mary. Wow. <laughs> That's he was, bold statements. He, he said we should go around looking for Mary like a crackhead. Wow. Like he used these words, like like a yeah. drug addict searching for his drug. We should only seek Mary everywhere. Yeah. And again, we should reiterate that when you're seeking Mary, you're seeking Christ. It's it's yeah. difficult for for many people to yeah. swallow that. Yeah. And to it really sounds understand. madness. Yeah. It's it's there's a lot of nuance in that. Yes. And I would say though, this has been one of the areas that I see Our Lady using you in a powerful way to reach people. Uh, you know, through your videos, yeah. through your content, your some of your videos have had incredible audiences. Right. Praise be to Jesus. Thank you, yeah. And uh, explaining some of these difficulties yeah. to a new audience. Yes, so the the plan is to win. I, I now now see my job no longer as a YouTuber, content creator, just to put a couple of videos out every once in a while. I now see this as an invasion. So our Lord Jesus Christ came as a warrior king, mm-hmm. and he came to invade Satan's territory. And now we need special ops that will not lose. And there's one. It's called the General of the Virgin Mary. And those children of her, the more children of Mary we can get and equip with especially these two methods, the more victory and the quicker this victory will turn around. So Maximilian Colby says, you should focus on two things, having the presence of Mary, because when Mary's present, things happen. So and that can be through looking at prayer cards, that can be through talking to her, that can be through just visualizing her, lifting your heart up to her, and then seeking to do her will. Mm-hmm. And you, in, when you consecrate your conscience, then that's when Our Lady begins to speak more clearly to you. Because a lot of people, especially through the Father Gately and all these wonderful new books on Mary and consecration, they talk a lot about, they talk a lot about, hey, give Mary your merits, give her your prayers, and trust her your family, which is good. But Maximilian Colby would say, the one thing that separates you from an animal is your will. Anybody can say, blessed mother, I give you my merits. Blessed mother, I give you my family. If you're wise, you will do that. But it takes death to say, Mary, what is your will? 
wh where do you want me to go? What do you want me to say? What do you want me to wear? How do you want me to do it? Because that means I die. And then for me as a rosary pusher, as, as the, the, the preeminent devotion, only now do I understand the purpose of the rosary once figuring this out. The purpose of the rosary is to kill me. Every, <laughs> every time I pray it, I, I die inside. Yeah. And it turns you, so if the goal of the Immaculata is to make you like her for Christ, mm -hmm. it's, it's Mary's goal to, and this is Maximilian Colby, not me, when you, when you consecrate yourself to Mary, Mary puts you in her womb, and it's the role of the Holy Spirit to form Christ in the womb of Mary, to Christify the children of God through Mary with the power of the Holy Spirit. So if, the, if that's her number one goal, the rosary literally turns you into Mary because it makes you ponder what she pondered, the incarnation, how yeah. often? Nonstop. And goes through the entire life of Christ. So the number one reason people don't pray the rosary is because it's boring. But that's actually the number one reason why, well, it's the preeminent reason why we need to kill ourselves. Because when I pray it, it is no longer I who live, but now I am allowing God mm -hmm. to speak to me, to work in me, to purify me, to shape my mind, which is full of so many uh, stupidities and t things that waste life. Um, you know, real quick, the yeah. there's, I was, you know, everything you're saying is just like, piercing my heart right now and the i was reading something yesterday yeah or was the day before uh feast of saint cecilia i was reading this and it was talking about i gotta go find it and bring it and show it to you it was talking about the three deaths yes. there, there are three deaths so you have the death of the body mm -hmm. which is you know everyone's gonna die one day our yeah. body's gonna die and death of the soul which yeah. is uh something that we should try to avoid right. which is oh, eternal sure. damnation yeah. and uh and then third thing is death by grace and he talked about how and God, with His grace, will kill you. Yes. And it was. I was like, "What?" I yes, was like, "I had never heard that before." Yes. And it was. And it, and it directly was talking about not directly with the Rosary and Our Lady, right. but the same idea of right. God killing us, killing yes. our our desires for things, our desire, our everything, our yes. will for anything that's not God. Yes. And that's exactly what I was thinking of when you were saying that. Yes. And that you're saying that. Triggered that memory of Father Karapi. You don't remember that he would say, "Do damage to yourself, kill yourself." And I always <laughs> thought, "Well, that sounds kind of harsh. You can't say that in our PC culture." No. But now I understand. I understand more clearly what that means. Like we have to make room for God. Gabriel Nicholas Castillo is garbage and trash. The only good thing about me is mm -hmm. what God has given me and what Our Lady wants to do. And I am the biggest obstacle for God's will. You know. Uh that yes, so I've, I've mentioned this sort of the sentiment before many many times on Catholic radio, yes. saying yes, Our Lady said yes, and salvation takes yes. on flesh, right? Yes. Gives us an opportunity. And I always like to point out there wasn't like a list of other young virgins on standby right. waiting yes, for her. Exactly, because if she said no, well then I'll just go to nope. the next village over. Yeah. Everything hung on yes. this one person yes. who had free will, and uh, it's a powerful thought. But uh, maybe we won't give you know birth to the Messiah and the yes. Savior of humanity, but our yes still has a powerful opportunity yes. to do so much. And if you think about, and, and this is all new to me, like I'm just, this has been blowing my mind the past couple weeks. So when you look at the analogies, for example, or the, what is that, the ty typology of Our Lady in the Ark of the Covenant, for yeah. example— and the Ark of the Covenant, we all know that we've all read the Scott Hahn with you know, the Word of Flesh, et cetera, et cetera. God bless Scott Hahn. Hope he's doing well. Um, but we don't realize is that Our Lady, the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament was a weapon. They would take the Ark of yes. the Covenant into battle yes. and they would win. Mm. They, they marched the Ark of the Covenant around the city of Sin, Jericho. The walls came crashing down. They had the Ark of the Covenant in the Temple Dagon. The false gods came crashing down. Yeah. When the Philistines started to abuse the Ark, which is the unbelievers, and and I would say symbolize Satan, yeah, our, the Ark of the Covenant humiliates them. The scripture says that they died from hemorrhoids. They didn't just <laughs> die. They died a humiliating death. <laughs> they died really badly. And so when we become like Mary, that same, that same typology is going to be lived out wherever we go. Yeah. When we bring Mary into our families and we're truly trying to do her will, she will give us inspirations 
that, that that way it's not us and our harshness and the way we deal with people. But when we allow Mary to deal with our family members who may be fallen away, you'll see walls come crashing down, barriers that might have been in the family. You'll see false gods mm -hmm. that we've set up of money, of sex, of fame come crashing down. And we will win battles. We will win victories. Mm -hmm. D demons will be driven out. But the key in all of this is Mary. Mary always brings Jesus. She always, always brings Christ, and she always turns her children into Christ. That is her goal. That is her role. So wow. she's the key. She's the secret, and we've got to get that secret out. Well, as we wrap up our conversation yes. with you, Gabriel Castillo, uh, it has been a powerful one at that. What would you say is your, your best advice to someone who's been writing that line? Sort of their heart's been tugging on them to say, hey, or their conscience even pricking them to say, yes. you know, this life you're living is not good. And, yes. you, and you need to do something about this. What would you say to that? I person? would say make a strong consecration of your life to the Virgin Mary solemnly and personally. You don't have to prepare for 33 days. Do it as soon as possible. Do a 33-day preparation if you want, but do it. And then in that, beg for the grace to pray the rosary. A lot of times, it the rosary will be dry. You're going to get zero to very little consolation. You'd rather watch paint dry. <laughs> I would rather watch ants build an ant pile. But if you do it, there are promises associated with the rosary that Our Lady guarantees, and it is the devotion that she has picked. In every major Marian apparition, Our Lady has always reiterated the importance of the rosary. And the more you do it, the better. So I promote praying all the mysteries of the rosary, but you can do more than that. There is truly no problem that cannot be overcome by the power of the rosary. And I'll tell you one quick testimony that I just now uh, have been pondering. I had a dear friend who had all the addictions of the world. His whole family was a wreck. His whole family was on marijuana. Some of his siblings were using harder drugs. Oh, wow. All in mortal sin. The, the, the mom was living with a man who is not her husband because one person, the, the first brother, consecrated his life over to the Virgin Mary, started praying all the mysteries of the rosary every day. That tri trickled into his other brother, who started praying all the mysteries of the rosary, completely pure, lives like an angel now. The sister has given up her drugs and now prays all the mysteries of the rosary. The mom left the man that she was living with, who she was legally married to, but she was not married in the eyes of God, and now she prays all the mysteries of the rosary. Their family is filled with spiritual fruit of vocations, of their going now from victory to victory, all because one person started praying the rosary every day and took it seriously. There is not a circumstance that Our Lady cannot overcome. The problem is sin and Satan. And Our, Our Lady's number one, she, that's like at the top of her resume, crushing the head of the serpent. That's what she does best. That's what she enjoys doing. It humiliates the serpent. I don't care what your sin is. I don't care what... I went and t I, I spoke in Portland, Oregon, as you probably know, and over there they have a lot of problems. And I told those men, and I'll tell the people here, I don't care if you've got two sons that were born women. Our Lady will figure out a way to get those children into heaven. <laughs> I promise you, there's no problem. And I know that there's a lot of serious problems out yeah, there. Yeah, for sure. Our Lady can do anything. Amen. And Amen. she will. Praise we have God. to give her a body. I... I St. Teresa of Avila said, Jesus has no hands and feet except for ours. Well, I'm going to credit this to St. Maximilian, even though I don't think he came up with it. I'll give him credit for it. Our Lady has no hands and feet except for ours. And what do the feet of Our Lady do? They crush serpents. Amen. So let's get at it. Love that. Praise be to God. What a great place to end. Gabriel Castillo, thank you for your time today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Wasn't that really inspirational? Gabriel Castillo, Claire Allerud, their yes is literally impacting so many souls, which reminds me of your yes. Thank you for being members of the Perpetual Light Society. Your perpetual gift every single month makes it possible for us to share the good, the true, and the beautiful with literally tens of thousands of souls through the powerful medium of Catholic Radio, and you won't even know who these people are on this side of the heavenly veil. So it is an incredible gift that you are giving, so thank you for that. Can I just remind you that the GRM mobile app is a fantastic way to stay in touch, up-to-date, connected, listening to the Catholic content broadcast every day across the Guadalupe Radio Network. 
Adrian, how can they get that? Absolutely. You can get our app, the Guadalupe Radio Network app, not the GRN app. Notice I, I've said in the past, you know, GRN app, but no, it's the Guadalupe Radio Network app. You can get it on the Android Google Play Store or on the Apple Store, and you just go into your phone and download it right there, and you can keep in touch with Joe and I at the Catholic Drive Time Show, or you can keep it up with your local station and find out what's going on there. And you can also listen to us later because, you know, I don't blame if you don't want to get up early. So we have the podcast feed there so you can tune in anytime you want, anywhere you are. If you have an internet connection, that's anywhere on the Android, Google Play Store, and on the Apple Store if you look up the Guadalupe Radio Network app. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Again, thank you from all of us at the Guadalupe Radio Network. We could not be more grateful for you and your generosity. So God love you. God bless you. Don't forget to tune in again to the Catholic Drive Time, Monday through Friday, 7 to 9 Eastern, all across the GRN. God bless you. God love you. And we'll see you next time.